What is that one thing or those two things that you've been saying, no, God, I can't do that? When in essence, when you've been saying you can't, we've been saying God can't. What is that? I want you to look at it. I want you to think about it. I want it right there in full view. What is it? What are you afraid of? You know, I'm a question guy because I believe questions. When you ask questions, it kind of it kind of forces an answer. So, what are you afraid of? A lot of people have a lot of different kinds of fears. Um, fear of spiders—that's a big one for me. I hate them. Big ones, small ones, brown ones, black ones, purple ones. I don't care. I don't like them. I'm afraid of them. For whatever reason, I just am. Uh, Now, snakes, some people have a fear of snakes. I don't care. You fill this room with snakes, I'm great. No issues, no problems. It's good. But uh, that's not a fear of mine. But for many of you, um, I can see by your shaking heads that that's that's opposite of mine. Some people have a fear of heights. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of weird. I, I, I don't have a fear of heights as long as I'm outside. But if I'm inside, I have a fear of heights. It's weird, isn't it? You could take me as high as you want to take me outside. But inside, I climb a ladder in this, in this room, I'm just shaking. Um, some people have a fear of speaking in public. Um, it's actually the greatest fear that there is. And it's been that way for years and years and years, even more so than dying. And, and, and is speaking in public. People, people don't like that. People have all kinds of fears. Fear of fire, fear of, 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 of all that. But, but what are you afraid of? I mean, seriously, what, what are you afraid of? Because I know those are real fears, but today I want us to dig a little bit deeper and, and really look at what really scares us. What paralyzes you? What absolutely, what fears in your life absolutely just stifle you and grip you and keep you from experiencing life the way that I believe God created us to experience it? What keeps you from dreaming? I'm a dreamer, always have been, probably always will be. There are certain fears in our life that keep those dreams from happening. What keeps you from dreaming? What keeps you from chasing those dreams and accomplishing those dreams what actually keeps you from living your life you know fear is one of satan's greatest weapons one of the greatest things that he uses to stifle us and to keep us down and to hold us back he can wreck our lives with it but it clearly doesn't stop there because fear wrecked lives create fear wrecked families and fear wrecked families create fear wrecked communities and it's just this, this cycle that just continues. And, 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 and it may start with one person or one individual, but, but it can just grow. It's such a big deal. It continues on to affect entire nations and even the world. This is actually what happens in our, our movie clip in this series, The Hunger Games. Most of you have probably seen that. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I enjoy watching movies that have purpose and have meaning inside in the stories. And this particular story begins pretty close to where we started the clip today. The Hunger Games and and the fear that was gripped by the world, or at least the country of Pan Am. This whole thought of this whole process that yearly one boy and one girl was picked from every district to be a part of this ridiculous, crude, brutal game, which ultimately was a fight to the death. And and see, the, the fear to me wouldn't have just been on that day, standing in that square or in that, that central place of whose name was going to get drawn. That fear was so gripping to me, and you can tell by not only the first movie but the rest of them, that it gripped the entire, the, the entire country year, year round. See, there was an exhale moment when that name was called, but it was only for a moment because then that fear was regripped, knowing that the next year that person standing there feeling like, well, that could be me. And it was intentional fear caused by the government and and caused by President Snow to keep people in control, to keep people under wraps, to keep them from standing up and being the people that they were created to be, doing the things that they were created to do. And to me, that sounds a lot like Satan. 
That sounds a lot like what he wants because he wants to stifle you. He doesn't want you to fulfill the, the things that God has put inside of you. He doesn't want you to realize that you truly are a masterpiece, as Ephesians 2.10 says, to do all the good works that God created and planned for you a long time ago. He doesn't want you doing that. And if he can keep you gripped in fear and keep you stuck in the mud, then he can keep those things from happening. Fear. Now, I know that this is just a movie, but people live in that kind of fear every day. Will I mess up? Will I fail? You know, the fear of failure is also one of the greatest fears. And can I just tell you today, if you're, if, if, to be successful in life, you have to be willing to fail. Now, nobody wants to fail. I don't want to fail. However, to be successful, you can't be afraid of it. You cannot be afraid of making a mistake. You cannot be afraid of falling short. I've said for many, many years, I just kind of pinned the statement that I felt like God gave me in my heart years ago. Those who fail aren't the ones who fall. It's the ones who fail to get back up. I'm not afraid of falling. We learn some of our greatest lessons in, in falling and in failure, but, but people are afraid of it. Will I make the wrong choice? Will I let someone down? Fear of heights. Once again, fear of being in front of people. Fear of flying. Fear of dying. And some people, ironically, are afraid of living. People have a fear of living. But there's a choice, and we can grab onto fear, or we can grab onto courage. In Matthew chapter 14, the disciples had been out on this boat all night. And then very early the next morning, they noticed something. They noticed something out in the middle of the lake, and it was moving. And, and at first they thought it was a ghost. And they were panicked, and they were afraid. In fact, they yelled out, it's a ghost. But, but it wasn't a ghost, it was Jesus, and he was walking on the water coming to them. And in Matthew chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus said this. He said, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. In this moment of great fear that gripped his disciples, he spoke out and said, take courage. Actually, this means to grab courage. Take courage. There, that word means to grab it, which means you physically have to reach for it. It's there if you want it. But you are responsible, I am responsible for grabbing a hold of it. That's what that word means. Grab it. It's there. If you want it, take it. Be confident. And church today, courage is more than a feeling. Courage is more than what that, that, that is welled up inside of us when we're facing a big task or when we're facing something scary. It's, it's more than just that feeling. It requires action. See, like in this movie clip that we showed in Katniss, and I'll reference this movie a little more in today's message than I have in the first three, just because, and there's a lot of things in this that just, even just this one little clip that just speaks so loud. Because don't think for a second that, and, and just think hypothetically, like if this movie was real, don't think for a second that her heart wasn't pounding. When that hand was in that jar, wondering whether or not her name was going to be the one pulled up. Because you could tell by the look on her face and just that quick shot before the name was read. Don't think there wasn't fear there when, when, when she heard that, that that was her sister's name. And in that moment, in that moment, she grabbed courage. In that moment, she said, no, I'm going to stand up for what I believe. And what she believed in was her family and, and her sister. See, her life was a very terrible situation. She lived in poverty. She was the only source of income because her father had died and her mother was so gripped by depression that she could barely function. But Katniss in this movie and in this series does everything she can to help her family survive. And later on, her country. So it's no surprise that when the reaping comes, when her little sister's name is drawn, that she reaches deep down inside and she grabs courage. 
when faced with fear, when faced with the possibility of dying even, she grabbed courage. She realized that the only way that her sister would probably survive was for someone to take her place. You know, if that was my little sister, I would do the same thing. If it was one of my children or my grandchildren, and many of you would say the same thing, well, if that was my kid, if that was my brother, if that was my sister, I would stand up and face that fear. I would stand up in that moment, and I would be the one that says, you know, I volunteer. I will do it. And you know what? We'll stand up and and, and face fears like that. We'll stand up and fight for our family. We'll fight for the ones that we love, even in, 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 in those situations. Maybe we would make that same decision even for a close friend. But what happens when it comes to everyday life choices? We may not let a family member die, but we often let a dream die. And we may stand up for that situation, but when it comes to me and comes to the things that God has spoken to my life, we let that die. It's like we're too afraid to take that step. What about a job promotion or a relationship or a God calling? How willing are we to let our life go because we allow ourselves to be imprisoned by fear? Now, let me tell you something really quickly. Fear does not come from God. I know the Bible tells us to fear God, but that is a reverent fear. It's a respectful fear. It is not a cowering fear. And we need to understand that. God is not a tyrant. I know sometimes he's painted to be such, but, but according to the Bible that I read, he's not. So, so, so when we talk about, though, this kind of fear that stifles us, 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear. That kind of fear does not come from him, but instead he gives us power and of love and a sound mind. So why are we afraid? I mean, really think about it. If we are truly followers of Christ and we say, yes, this is the road that I'm walking, why do we live in so much fear and why do we allow that to to, to, to keep us from experiencing that life? And I, I believe it's because although we believe in God, we don't believe in ourselves. We may believe in God, but we don't believe in ourselves. It's easy to say that we trust God until God asks us to do something that scares us completely to death. And then suddenly we have no faith, no courage. It's like we know God is big enough and strong enough, but I'm not. I can't do that. There's no way, but God might change. You know, my life might change. My surroundings might change. What if this happens? What if that happens? God, that's just too big or that's just too much. I just can't do that. And, and, and I want to I share a statement with you this morning that as I was preparing earlier this week and and, and I'd kind of written some things down, and I found myself in a tree um, down, down at, at, at my family's place in Arkansas. And, and I love being in a tree in the fall, by the way, even if I don't see anything, but, but I just love it. And, and, and when I was thinking about, about, you know, some of this stuff and some of this moment, this is, I, I, I feel like God spoke this to me. that You know, when we tell God that we can't, we are actually telling God that he can't. Think about that for just a second. That, that has gripped me. When we say we can't, we're actually telling God that he can't. It's like we, we, we lose that faith and we allow that fear that Satan has thrown up in our face to, to, to just grip us to that point. And maybe some of you saying, wait a minute, I'm not telling God that. Well, I would ask you to check your heart. This whole Nicaragua thing as we get down to, I'm counting in my head, 51 days. Boy, what a journey. It would have been so easy just to simply say, we can't do that, God. Nobody else has ever done this before. We can't do that. But not one time during that, this whole experience have we said that. Not one time. Everything that's, that, that's come against us, every, everything that Satan has, has propped up in front of us, every wall that he's built, every, every glitch that's happened, we've, we've backed up and we, we've dealt with it. And, 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 and we've tried to just get through the things the best that we know how and just believing and having faith in God. And God, if you designed this and you orchestrated this, then you will make this happen. 
See, I believe things like this and journeys like this and adventures like this are to, to stretch us. And I felt all along that whatever is supposed to happen, God will make happen as long as we do exactly what he's asked us to do. It's been scary. But we could have said we can't do that. But by saying that, we would have been saying that God couldn't make that happen, that he wasn't big enough, that he couldn't provide the things that we need and do the things that we need. One of the big fears was the money. <laughs> it's been crazy. By the way, church, you have been so generous in this adventure. Everything that, 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 that had opportunity that's provided, you have been there. It's a big deal. And we are grateful. See, this is what I believe. And I, I believe that in, in things like this and really in life. Now, I know not everybody gets to go. But that doesn't mean that you're not a part. Not everybody in a church gets to stand and teach. Not everybody gets to stand and play. Not everybody gets to run a computer. Not everybody gets to teach a kid, although I believe everyone should at least have that opportunity once. Not everybody comes in early and makes your coffee and your drinks. But we're all apart. We all have our place. And just like in this trip, you, you, those of you that can't go, you've been so generous in your prayers and in your giving but the money's been a fear. It's still a fear, by the way. I'll just tell you right now, flat out, we need 4,500 more bucks. That's what we need. Not going to ask you for it. I'm going to believe God for it. Why is it that God or Satan uses money to be a stifling so much? Boy, it just aggravates me, doesn't it? But I trust God. But is there fear? Is there uncertainty? You bet. But is there enough for me to back up and, and say, we can't do this because if I stand up or our team stands up and says we can't do this, then we quit and we're saying God couldn't do it. God created you for a purpose and a plan, and that purpose and a plan is nothing short of changing the world. And maybe you won't change the entire world, but as I preached this a few months ago, you can change your world. Your world. You can stand up and make that decision, and you can stand up and say, I volunteer. I volunteer. In the face of fear, in the face of uncertainty, I can do that. Stop saying no to the things that God is asking you to say yes to. Now, many of you have heard me say that no is one of the greatest words that you will ever learn how to say. It radically changed my life a few years ago to learn how to say no. You need to learn how to say no to stuff. But we need to, 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 to constantly be growing in how to say yes to God. So what have you been saying no to for all this time? Another question. Put it right here. What is that one thing or those two things that you've been saying, no, God, I can't do that? When in essence, when you've been saying you can't, we've been saying God can't. What is that? I want you to look at it. I want you to think about it. I want it right there in full view. What is it? What is it that God's been asking you to do over and over and over again, yet you have allowed your fear to keep you from standing up and stepping out? You know, Katniss Everdeen was a 16-year-old kid, but she was a 16-year-old kid that had gifts. Perhaps her greatest gift was that she was defiant. Now, that in itself probably isn't such necessarily a good thing, so I'm going to call it boldness. Children, listen to me. Don't be defiant. The pastor said I could be bold. That's okay in the right way. Call it bravery. Call it willingness to stand up on her own. Not only is she defiant, she's very clever when it comes to the outdoors, and she's incredible with a bow and arrow. Those of you that have seen that know that. She's so poor, she spent her whole life surviving in the woods. Her hard life has prepared her for this. By the way, side note, sometimes those struggles in life prepare you for some of your biggest battles. And remember, Katniss is in a battle to the death, and there are several other gifts that I would like to have if it was me. You know, a sword, a gun. But she doesn't focus on her limitations. 
but rather she focuses on what she can do using the unique gifts that she's been given. That's courage. That's courage. How often do you find that you are having a pity party for yourself because you can't do what other people can do? I'm getting teachy today. How often did we just sit down and, man, I stink. I'm worthless. I can't do that. I can't do what they do. I can't sing like they can. I can't play like they can. I can't cook like they can. I can't do this. I can't do that. I just can't. I used to have those pity parties all the time. Until God looked at me one day, and I truly believe this, said, get over it. So I will pass that statement on to you today. Get over it. Just get over it. You weren't designed or created to be someone else. You were designed and created to be you. You. Unique. Special. Get over it. I've got to get over it, too. The Holy Spirit doesn't give us fear, but God's Spirit gives us gifts. And I want to talk to you about that for just a second, because God wants you to use those gifts. Everyone has them. The Bible says everyone has gifts. And the the gifts that have been given to you are, are, are meant to be used, to change the world. But in order to do it, you have to let go of your fear and grab on the courage. I want to go back to Matthew chapter 14, where we started this whole, this whole adventure. Jesus is walking on the water, and Peter decides that he wants to try it. And he says, hey, Jesus, I want to check this out. Can I do this? And he says, come on. Now, seriously, you, I preach this a hundred times, and, and, and you think about every single time I think about it, would, if I was standing in that boat, and those waves were rocking and rolling, and, and, and there's Jesus walking on the water, I'm going to think that that's really cool, and there might be a thought in my mind that says, well, I would really like to try that. And, and we could get to that point, but taking that first step, do you imagine, can you imagine how much fear he had to conquer in that moment? Just in that moment, just to take the first step. And, can, can, and, and just picture this. I mean, and he, and he kind of feels like, oh, I'm not sinking. And he, and he transfers that weight. And I'm not doing it because I'll fall on my face right here. This isn't water. Unless, Eli, you would catch me. But then that second foot comes out of the boat and he's standing. Can you imagine just that feeling? Can you imagine those, the, the, that feeling of just in that moment? Oh my goodness, I'm doing it. It's happening. Why was it happening? Because Jesus said, come on. He said, come on. If you want to do it, come on. It was kind of like grabbing courage. He said, take courage. If you want it, it's yours. Grab a hold of it. Peter said, I want to walk on water. Jesus said, come on. It was up to Peter at that point, not Jesus. People say, well, Jesus made it happen. Part of it. But he still had to get out of the stinking boat. He still had to conquer the fear in that moment. But then, in that moment, what was he overcome with? Fear. The one thing that he had conquered to allow him to experience something that no other person in history has ever experienced other than Jesus. In that very moment, Satan said, not so quick, buddy. Because then the focus was on the surroundings and everything else. Matthew 14, verse 30 says, But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. And he said, Save me, Lord. He shouted. At the first sign of struggle and the first sight of a storm in our life, we want to quit. But we can't. See, this fear thing isn't one and done. We face fear every single day of our lives. And the way that we handle it as followers of Jesus is with faith. It's faith. 
to trust that the same God who helped Jesus walk on water is the same God who resurrected Jesus from the grave. And it's the same God who will help us overcome our fears. The same God. He's not different. Nothing different. Believing that if God sets something in motion, that he wants that to happen. And if he says, come on, then it's up to us to say, okay. I go back to this journey of that shipping container that sit out there for several weeks. And we get the call last Wednesday that said, uh, this needs to be here uh, by Friday. Uh, this was a week, week ago. <laughs> and the panic mode set in. Probably some fear. And so we go through all this stuff, and we get all this stuff done. And, and, and we, you know, we spend that evening. We, we get it packed. It looks good, too. I have to believe it's still looking good. So then on Monday morning, we say, all right, we're going to load this thing. And... and uh, so we get here, and Dennis's truck is, is still in the shop. Been there a while. So we borrow a truck, so thankful for that. And we get here, and we get it all hooked up, got the trailer. And Travis comes over, and so gracious and thankful for, for them and, and for Scott and Sandy for letting him come. And so he gets on, now he got it off of there. It was kind of hairy. I think I wasn't here when that happened, right? But, but then he pulls in there, and he gets up underneath that thing, and, and he picks it up, and he backs up just a little bit, and he gets off of the, the, the angle there where it gets kind of flat because we're simply just thinking he's going to pick this thing up and set it right down on top of the trailer. Yeah, the back end just goes whoop. And there he's sitting on two wheels just kind of looking at us. What are we going to do? I mean, it honestly, now... A lot of different things went through our mind. But so we start thinking, all right, what, what can we do? How can we do this? What do we have? And so we thought of all these people, and we tried to make some phone calls, and we kept hitting these dead ends and dead ends. And, and then I and then you know, thought, hey, you know, I'll just say it. Dennis said, I'm going to call the mayor. So Dennis called the mayor. He said, Mayor, we need help. The mayor said, okay, I'll help you. So Kevin Richards, some of the city boys come over, and we, we had Travis on one end, and Kevin Richards on another machine on the other end, and they kind of jogged that thing up just a little bit and got it up high enough where we could back the trailer underneath that thing, and we set it right down, and then Kevin drove off and went and got another rig and come back and lifted it up, got the boards underneath it, got it all fastened down. It looked real good. We were ready to roll, baby, ready to roll, and we get to Bryant Hill. We are cruising down the road. Everything's good. We're excited. We're going to make it. We get to Bryant Hill, and, and the truck overheats. So we get to the top, and it starts to cool off. And Dennis said, well, maybe I pushed it a little bit too hard. <laughs> so we limped it to the Casey's in Seymour. We pull in. We go in and buy some antifreeze, and, you know, we, it's hot. You know, we get that antifreeze put in there, and we're thinking, all right. And so, you know, and oh, man, we could just quit. I mean, Satan just kept throwing stuff. Nope, we're going. So we pull out and we head back up. We make it to the next stoplight. This is, we got to go back. So we did a U-turn. There wasn't a no U-turn sign. <laughs> and we limp it back. And the whole way back, we're like, we've got to get this. It has to be there today by 4 o'clock. By 4 the whole way back, who can we call? And we're calling people, and Dennis is calling people, and we're striking out, and nothing's happening. And we get an okay on an old farm truck, but we're like, oh, man, that just ain't going to work. And so, but then we get back here, and then all of a sudden, it's just like, you know, because Satan clouds our minds with all this frustration and all these things. And, and then it's just like Buffy walked out, and it was just like, oh. And she throws a name out. What about Sean Bovard? That's Dane's dad. We're like, really? Made a phone call. He said, absolutely. We're like, yes. We're going in the Cadillacs of all Dooley's. So we, Dennis calls him. He gets the number to his uh, security thing out there. And we drive out there to get it. We keep punching the number in. It don't open. 
we punch it in, it don't open. We go to the back side of the garage, there's another thing, we punch it, it don't open. We're like, what? I mean, by this time, it's like 11.30, quarter to 12, we have to be in Kansas City. On actually, in, we're, we're in Kansas on the other side, on the west side, by 4 o'clock. And uh, Dennis is taking a picture and sending him text. What do we do? So finally he calls him and he says, we were at the wrong garage. <laughs> so we walk up the hill and we put in the deal and it opens. Yes. So drive it back to town. Back it up. Get ready to drop the ball thing. The fifth wheel hitched out on there and Dennis is laying up there in the truck next to it and about that time the whole trailer slips off the block now Dennis probably wouldn't tell you that but it just missed his arm by yeah it was a serious deal never mind jack it back up change the ball out, we hook it up, and down the road we go. We left Ava at 12.15. We pulled into that yard at 4.02. We conquered the fear of meeting a highway patrolman. But we made it. But then the adventure's not over. We get there. Because this is just a dropping point. It has to get from this point to a rail yard, the railroad depot, which is just a spit away. They wouldn't let us go because we didn't have a license. We could have just dropped it there. Guy that we dropped it said, well, we're not taking it. Your broker here is supposed to take it. Well, he said you were supposed to take it. Well, I don't care who's supposed to take it. Somebody find out. So we left that thing in that yard that day, just faith, with a fear, because this has to be there before December 27th. So we get the email that it's all taken care of, and right now it's on a train on its way to L.A. Now, we're exhaling somewhat, but there's still a fear. Is there not? It's got to get there. It's got to clear customs. It's got to all this stuff. Fear, conquering fear. But at any point in time, we could have stopped in any part of this journey and said, God, I can't do this. We can't do it. It's too much. It's too hard. It's too frustrating. And I'm tired of it. Can't do it. And we could have allowed fear to overcome us and keep us from doing what God wanted us to do. The first sign of hardship, when we start sinking, we want to quit, but we can't. We can't. I want you to hear some powerful promises from God in his word. Words to cling to when fear sets in. Deuteronomy 31.6 says, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. Everybody say with. with. That is a key word. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He goes with you, alongside of you, right there with you, every step of the way, right there, right there. If the worship team would come up, that would be phenomenal. Psalms 118, 6 and 7 says, the Lord is with me. Everybody say with. Right alongside me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? The Lord is with with me he is my helper and i look in triumph on my enemies and i like this one in psalms chapter 23 many have heard this the 23rd psalms and in verse 4 it says even when i walk through the darkest valley now it says when even when not even if not maybe, it's when. It's going to happen. You are going to face times in your life where fear is going to rise up and it's going to smack you right in the face. When it happens, when you go through it, when the struggles come, when the phone call comes, when the situation comes, he says, I won't be afraid. He says, I won't be overcome by that fear. Fear will not grip me. Fear will not stop me. For you are close beside me right here 
right here. Sometimes we think that God is so far away in those moments, in those big things, in those big situations. We look at when, you know, when all of this is going on, the winds and the waves and all this stuff. You know that whole story with Peter and Jesus? You know where Jesus was the whole time? In the same place as when he started. He was in the same place when he said, come on, Peter. You want to walk on water? Come on. He didn't move. He didn't abandon him. He didn't walk off. I have to believe he didn't even take a step backwards. In fact, the story says that he reaches forward out to pick him up when Peter cries, save me. He's right there, right there beside you, with you. He said, your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. We will face fear of some kind every single day of our lives. Some small fear, some monumental fear, some fears that you need to conquer, some that you just, I can't. If we are really following Jesus with all that we are, and we're all in, Satan's not going to be real happy about it. He's going to fight us with fear. He wants to keep you from doing the things that God wants you to do. But our, one of our greatest weapons is hope. I want to end with this, this scripture in Ephesians 6.10. Ephesians 6, verse 10 through 13, it says, Finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, and against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. To stand. We're at war. I mean, really, we are. God is looking for a few good men and a few good women to stand up and step out and face their fears. Be brave. Jesus said, take courage. If you want it, grab a hold of it. It's yours. All you got to do is reach out and grab it. That's it. Just do it. Just take it. Face the junk. Face the stuff. Face the attacks. Face the fights. I preached this before and I believe this remember I said earlier that our struggles in life prepare us for something later see I go to the first message that Peter preached actually you can back up and go to that point in time where he denied Christ three times and even in that denying even in that failure even in that fall he didn't stay down he got right back up I have to believe in the back of Peter's mind in some place in some way there was this thought gosh he let me walk on Man, life stinks sometimes. People treat you bad. But he let me walk on water. He let you walk on water. Be brave. <laughs> Keep walking. In the middle of the battle, when we've stepped out of the boat, We've got to keep moving towards Jesus. Yes, your marriage may be in crisis, but you keep moving. Don't you quit. Maybe you've been given a diagnosis that you didn't expect. Maybe your kid is making some really poor choices. Maybe you just found out your friend is a secret addiction, whatever, in these life moments. We have to make a choice. We can quit and run away from God or we can be like Peter and simply call out, Lord, save me. See, in that moment, a lot of people, and I've heard this talked about before, they call that a moment of failure for Peter. I look at it as a moment of him realizing where his strength comes from. Nothing wrong when you're sinking to say, Lord, save me. But so many times when we're sinking, we just let ourselves go. Don't quit. Don't quit. So what is it today that you need to let go of? What are you facing? What fear? 